I'm ready if you're ready. Yes, my lord. My lord, I, I um, beg leave to call the complainant's last witness, um, Mr. Gabriel Krauser. seated if you wish, but just spell for me the surname. Krauser, C-R-O-U-S-E. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Mr. Krauser, um, am I correct that you're an employee of the Institute for Race Relations? That's correct. Could you tell us a bit about the Institute? Yes, thank you. The Institute of Race Relations was founded in 1929 as an umbrella organization formed out of various civil society and religious organizations that opposed the racial policies of the day, particularly emanating out of the 1930 Land Act, which deprived especially black South Africans of the right to own that. <coughs> was unconscionable to the population and the motive for its for its founding was to achieve greater reach and greater research capacity by bringing together uh, as many members as possible. Uh, the, the, the twin objectives of the institution foster better relations across races between people in South Africa and to understand better what the conditions were, in particular what the conditions in South Africa were as a result of race-based laws which the IRR opposed. Uh, that is how it was founded in, in trying to achieve those objectives. I think it is fair to say that the IRR became the world's most respected anti-apartheid think tank. It scrutinized every aspect of the wicked uh, regime that dominated and oppressed South Africa. And it used that research uh, in what we often describe as a battle of ideas to, to humiliate those who aimed to perpetuate the system of race-based oppression and thereby bring about change in a peaceful manner. Uh, there was around 1994, but generally towards the end of the 80s and through the 90s, some debate within the IRR about whether it should continue after the collapse of apartheid, its mission having been so clearly connected to the apartheid regime and to trying to overcome it with ideas and information. The feeling that held a day was that 
the legacy of racial tension and oppression in South Africa will not end immediately, that it still poses dangers, and that it is still important to research, analyze, and understand race relations in South Africa. Um, and to make efforts to improve those relations. So the IRR did not discontinue with the collapse of the public. Since then, the IRR has become a fierce critic of various aspects of today's uh, governing regime. Uh, we have opposed, for example, the attempt to amend the Constitution to allow expropriation of non compensation. We have been critics of various race based laws, permanent action laws, including the EE. And right now, um, we have a campaign, for example, against the Employment Equity Amendment Bill. Um, so, so, that work of trying to understand government policy trying to understand the impact that it has, and then using that information uh, in an attempt to, to foster the conditions for a better South Africa that we want to Is the Institute uh, an organization that supports the constitutional value of non-rationalism? That's correct. That is our principal value. We have uh, a firm commitment to classical liberalism. One of the pillars of classical liberalism is non-racialism. And I understand non-racialism to be well expressed in various ways, but a, a famous way that you'll be familiar with, and which I think is correct, is that a person ought not to judge another person by the colour of their skin but instead you should judge another person by the content of their character. Can I ask you to tell me about the work that you do at the Institute? Yes, thank you. I am presently the head of campaigns at the Institute of Race Relations. Um, a large part of my work product is therefore the issuing of press releases and communication with the South African public through independent media, uh, television, radio, and online digital media platforms. Um, I probably do a few interviews a week. Uh, the IRR overall I know makes about eight or nine impressions per day. So my work is relatively is a fraction of that, but that is, that is part of my role. That's not how I joined the Institute though, and it wasn't in that role that I appeared in Senecal. What, what role did you appear in at Senecal? I was there as an investigative reporter. The Institute of Race Relations founded and has been running a daily news website, I would say newspaper, in the contemporary sense, um, called the Daily Friend. Uh, its, its values are, in principle, the values of the Institute of Racial Relations, but its work product is uh, daily reporting on current affairs. In that regard, I was sent as a reporter for the Daily Maverick to Senegal to report insofar as possible on what happened inside the court on the day of a bail hearing with two men who were accused and have subsequently been exonerated for the murder of Brendan Horner and also to report on what happened outside of the court. Separate but connected to that, I investigated and reported on the murder of Brendan Horner per se. Just a quick um, clarification question. You mentioned that you do work for the Daily Friend, and then in your testimony you said Daily Maverick. Uh, Did I say the wrong word? My Lord, I'm very sorry. I, I'm advertising our competitors. <laughs> I meant to say the Daily Friend, and not 
matter. Although I have written things that have appeared in the date matter, that is not at all the regard in which I appear on that day. You stated that you'd written about um, Brendan Horder's murder. Um, could you discuss that in some detail? Yes, thank you. The, the emerging facts uh, before we appeared in the Siena Hall, um, and I believe it was October 16th for the bail hearing, uh, were as follows that Brennan Horner had been murdered on the 1st of October and found on the 2nd of October around daybreak, uh, tied to a fence post with a knife on a hat pointing his way. It was a very public display of the body that had been stabbed in the face, in the body, in the hands. There was indications of the struggle. And there was something particularly disturbing about how the body, the body had been left to be found. Uh, various commentators speculated that a signal was being sent. In the ordinary course of the crime, for example, a robbery that <coughs> goes wrong and results in a murder, one might expect the body to be concealed or to be left in place rather than to be dragged and tied to a fence post in this public display. So that was the first curious fact about this case that, that drew our attention. In speaking to farmers and farm workers in the Paul Rue community, my attention was drawn to allegations that Brennan Horner was murdered by people who belonged to a stock theft cartel that is an organized syndicate that uh, had managed to steal large quantities of stock in the area over a number of years. I furthermore had my attention drawn to uh, reports of these allegations in the newspaper Rapport, which is an Afrikaans newspaper. In that report, as well as in the subsequent English media reports, it was either denied or it was unclear whether the Hawks, the Special Investigations Unit, the Hawks, was in fact investigating such a cartel. This was a problem, partly because of the size and scope of the cartel, it was by a, by a back of the envelope calculation, uh, accused of being involved in the theft of over a million kilograms of cloven hoofed animal in the previous winter. Before that, so that's a it's a it's a hard thing to hide so much stock. Uh, in my reporting on stock theft and on farm murders in the years preceding that, because I have been with the institution in this regard since 2018, I have found many cases where. 20 cattle or 5 cattle were stolen. In fact, often farmers would report two sheep at a time, or two goats at a time, or one cow at a time. For so many cattle to be stolen, thousands to be stolen, um, <coughs> begs the question, where is it being kept? And how is it that so many units of stock can be kept with such a great value, tens if not hundreds of millions of rand, such that the police cannot find all of the stolen private property. So that was the first uh, reason we were concerned about whether an investigation into this was taking place at all, as some denials had been issued that there was such an investigation. The second concern was that a dossier which I was not able to fully access, 
but parts of which I was able to see, although not contained in my possession, because of the relationship that I had with my source. A dossier was alleged to have been provided to the Hawks many months before the murder of Brendan Waters, purporting to show that there was such a stock theft cartel, and alleging that various members of the police, of the South African police service, were involved in this cartel. This was extremely distressing to me as a staff member of the Institute of Race Relations because I consider one of our founding values to uphold the rule of law and law and order. We try to promote that. We, we think that is very important, amongst other things, for good race relations. And maybe I can go into that, but I will just say that for the investigation, I reached out to the Hawks. And um, it took some navigation, but eventually they confirmed in email to me that they had received this dossier. They neither confirmed nor denied what efforts of investigation had taken place up to that point. But they confirmed that at that point an investigation was taking place. In other words, I couldn't tell from what they said to me whether they had been investigating since they first got the dossier or whether they had only started investigating after the public outcry <coughs> at Brendan Horner's murder. To this day, I'm not sure. But what I can say, and, I'm, and what I'm sure could be easily confirmed, is that arrests were made with regards to that cartel, including the arrests of five police officers. Um, and... Yes, we would like to think that that all, all journalists and independent investigators that try to draw attention to these kinds of things are, in a sense, assisting the process of law and order uh, by drawing attention to these things. And when arrests are made, this is encouraging. Accountability, I think, is ultimately what, what lies in the public interest. You then said that um, you went to Senegal itself. Um, could you tell us on, on what dates you were there and, and what you saw. We drove from Johannesburg down to Senegal on the, on the 15th, if I have my dates correct, the day before the bail hearing. And we left on the day of the bail hearing. We did not stay there for long. We stayed outside of Senegal for the night. We went in early to Senegal in the morning. And I uh, stayed there for, for much of the day. We left after lunchtime, when most of the crowd had dispersed. And what did you observe on that day? Uh, would you like me to start with the night before or start with the day? Uh, the night before. Um, on arriving in Senegal, we observed very heavy policing. We were very encouraged by that. Our car was... Uh, not allowed through the blockade, no car that we could see was allowed to through the blockade without first being searched. We were quite <coughs> able to search for firearms and instructed that no firearms would be allowed further into Senegal. Uh, that was encouraging. We entered Senegal and uh, went to a petrol station, an engine petrol station, and uh, drew petrol and some of my colleagues made some purchases. I was there with various colleagues um, who had different missions to me. Sikhen Gubesi was there, much like me, to report on what he found. But other colleagues were there for other purposes. In any event, Sikhen and I spoke to some of the locals. Um, we were told that people were very worried about what lay ahead the next day. We were told this by residents that were black and that were white. Uh, when, when probed as to what the worry was, the worry was specifically described as being that the, the economic freedom fighters would arrive and do damage to the town of Senegal and would propagate uh, divisive uh, and racially based uh, rhetoric. Um, 
Um, we, I went over the road and across the road to the KFC. I bought a cigarette, I spoke to another local, and I had a similar conversation with a similar content. Uh, we returned and then went off to where we were staying that night, where we discussed the, the main event between Brendan Horner's murder and the bail hearing which was an attack on the court on October 6th. Uh, and then we went to sleep. The next morning we arrived at Senegal very early in the morning and we found again the thorough police uh, blockade lay ahead. But before we got to the police blockade, we found uh, various groups gathering on the side of the road. And in the course of the morning this amounted to three gatherings. The gathering, as far as I can tell, that was the furthest from Sienegal's magistrate's court, from the town, was of Africa. I should say, by the way, that on that morning we actually went to Paul the Roof first, because we thought that the court case, the bail hearing, might shift to a different time. We had been told something. That. that turned out not to be true. That's why. Anyway, so the first group was Africorum's group. They were the furthest away. The second group was uh, uh, a group of anti farm murder protesters who were praying and singing hymns. The third group was gathered closer to the barbed wire that had been set up at the edge of the town to separate groups. Then going into the town, I went to the court. Uh, there was a, a, a sort of mini hearing, I'm not sure what the correct term is. But the magistrate was being asked not to allow media into the court that morning. And I was asked to sign a petition for us to appear. Um, and I was also asked to do a live interview on SABC television to explain why Journalists want to be inside the court, but also to explain why we must respect the court's decision, one way or another. In between that, I interviewed people that I could interview and speak to. They included private security. They included uh, plainclothes police. They included uh, uh, uniformed officers. They included uh, security uh, hired by the EFF. Inside of town, there was also separate groupings, much like outside of town. There were two distinct groups, and this had been at the police's behest, is my understanding. The one group was the ANC, and ANC Youth League, and ANC Women's League, who were gathered close to the court, in a sort of town square, off, from my understanding, straight down country. And further, a block further, was the EFF truck, which was an impressive facility and it had speakers, and that is where the EFF leaders could gather to speak to uh, EFF supporters. That group was by far the largest group, and I should say that by and large the members of that group were clearly wearing EFF regalia, and the members of the ANC group were generally wearing uh, ANC regalia. When it comes to that group that was on the border of the town, there were t-shirts, for example saying Boer lives matter, or farmers lives matter, <coughs> um, that did distinguish what the political purpose was of that group, or, or how you could politically classify that group by some message it was trying to bring to the day. But there not being a, a political party on the outside groups. Maybe that was one reason they weren't all wearing the same thing. It wasn't as uniform. That's not to say the other two groups were perfectly uniform. It's just to say that there was a marked difference in that sense. The, the morning was in some respects confused because of the matter of whether the media would be allowed inside. 
It was also to some extent confused because of the matter of when would be best for the EFF leadership to address its audience and when would be best for the ANC to address its audience. I stayed inside at the time to try and see what was going on with that. I did see uh, the the EFF um, crowd settle down and listen to speeches. I struggled to always understand what was being said in those speeches. Uh, much of it was not in English, and I am only fluent or conversational in English, Afrikaans, and Russian. I have some small smattering of understanding of other languages, but not enough to fully comprehend um, what was being said. What I found concerning, that I made a note of, uh, was uh, a member of Parliament, Mlozi, saying that the EFF's mission was to bring down racism, and then to seem to define racism in a way that was inimicable to my understanding or to the understanding upon which my values of non-rationalism are built. Uh, and also, I heard uh, something that, that pricked my ear, and so I asked for a translation from uh, one of the people that I was standing by, and I should just explain, I was standing separate from the EFF crowd. The crowd was cordoned off. I was uh, with the police closer to the court, but right next to the crowd. Um, and, and when I asked, what was explained to me was that uh, uh, and he was saying something to the effect of uh, all the fire brigade, we must set fire uh, and that we must set fire to, to my understanding, this farmers or poors or something to that effect. Um, Just if I can ask you to pause there. You mentioned that uh, Mr. Ndlozi had uh, denounced racism in terms that disagreed with your understanding of racism. What terms did he use to describe racism? Uh, he described it as racist for for. <clears throat> My understanding was he was describing property rights as essentially racist, the Codessa Agreement as essentially racist, the, the, um, the founders of our constitutional dispensation as having engaged in some kind of racist activity, because the effect of our constitutional uh, our new constitutional South Africa is that all people are protected uh, insofar as if you own something, the state must protect you if someone else is trying to take that thing. And that if the state wants to take that thing, it has to compensate you for doing so. My value or my interpretation of what what racism is, is different to that, because on my interpretation, a racist is someone <coughs> who treats people differently based on their race. If I can then ask you to continue, you mentioned that Mr. Ndozi had sung a song. Yes. Yes, and I, as I said, I couldn't understand what the words meant, but I asked for or some help in understanding this. And, uh, and I've described what was it. Uh, the, the main event that we were looking forward to, I think both as journalists and, and the crowd, was to hear what the leader of the EFF, Julius Malema, would say. Very little was said by Julius Malema at the points that I was present. Um, I understand from footage and from reports that he gave a long speech later in the day. That was after I had left. On 
unfortunate. Um, but he did say, amongst other things, which I thought was actually quite sweet, that uh, there should be no music playing, uh, that the EFF should entertain themselves by singing songs. <coughs> That did not seem so sweet to me uh, shortly afterwards. And, and the reason that this pause was put in place, by the way, is that the leadership wanted to return to court in order to hear what was being said. And there were points in the back and forth that I followed the leadership of the EFF. I walked with Floyd Shibamba practically, I won't say next to him, but a step behind him, for example, on one of the journeys back to court. Because when the EFF leadership came down from the back of their stage, they would come past where we were. But after the crowd had been dismissed, as if to say the leadership is now vacating the stage, and that it is up to the crowd to keep themselves entertained, uh, because the leadership has must see what happens in the court, uh, or do some other business. Uh, I went to try to interview um, some members of the EFF. I had gone around because first I heard some people singing uh, Kill the Work, Kill the Farmer. And it did not strike me as safe to interview people while they were singing that song. So I went back to the court, I went around the back, I went up a different street and turned in. Uh, next to the police station, effectively. I thought this would be a good place to try and interview members of the EFF. I approached some members of the EFF and they said they would not speak to me and they pointed me to other people that I should speak to. I went deeper into the crowd, searching for people to speak to. And I was pointed further in. Um, I was unable to have an effective interview because I was told that I should only interview white people and that I should go back to the other side because that is where white people belong and that if anyone from the Daily Frame was to interview members of the EFF on that day should be a black person. I was quite worried because some people were threatening me with violence. Um, and I was eventually more or less escorted, I would say, out of that situation. If, I can just going to pause mind, there. You said um, some people threatened with violence. Was it? Do you know what? Um, which you mentioned different groups. Which they were clearly group? wearing ear and Um The. This did strike me as a surprise. I have interviewed members of the EFF many times, and I've been in very large EFF rallies. I was, for example, in the largest EFF rally, to my understanding, in 2019, in the soccer stadium in Soweto, just before the election. Um, and although it was me and 20 or 30,000 members of the EFF, I was never in danger. It was very clear to me that this was a peaceful gathering, and there were many people who were very eager to speak to me on that occasion. Um, and there <coughs> other occasions where I've been to the EFF rallies, where I've been treated respectfully as a member of the media. Um, uh, so this was outstanding uh, for me to be threatened. Even when I had identified myself as a journalist and said that my purpose was just to ask them how their day was, whether they were, were happy or sad with how the day was going. That, that is as far as I've managed to give you my question. And what, what happened uh, after that? I, um, I, I was effectively escorted back to some police who were uh, standing next to a, a police van. And if I can describe it like this, I was on a road that was parallel to the main road. And when I was escorted back, I could now see the road orthogonal. That means I had a view onto the main road. And there I could see that a large crowd of people 
uh, many of whom, although I wouldn't say all of whom, were in EFF regalia, uh, were moving to my right, which is to say were moving away from where their designated area was and towards um, basically the edge of town in front of the Wimpy uh, to where the, uh, those people had been gathered to protest against farm murders. Now, I can't say who was in front and whether those anti farm murder protesters had also, to some extent, left their designated zone. It was clear that the EFF had left their designated zone by several blocks. Um, and there was uh, some loud noises, and I received a message from a journalist that I knew who was closer there who said there's no way to get out of town. And I received a similar message from IRR members who were outside of town who could see some of what was happening. So my editor, the Daily Friend, asked me whether I would be okay because it was now impossible for me to leave town. And I had communicated to him that for the first time I'd been threatened in the course of, of my reporting. And I said that I would be okay because I would stay by the police. So I stayed by the police until um, I could see some dispersion in the crowd. The, the main crowd was still in the front, but some people <coughs> coming back had started to retreat. Then I and some journalists uh, dodged forward to try to capture footage of people throwing rocks um, from the EFF side and to also capture the images of uh, the detritus, the concrete public bins that had been broken to pieces and garbage that had been strewn therefrom, as well as the pieces of that being used uh, to throw. Um, if I can ask you to pause there, yes, were you aware of uh, who had broken these concrete bins? I did not see the breaking of a concrete bin, but I did see someone from uh, uh, the EFF crowd pick up a piece that had shattered from that bin and hurl it uh, in the direction of the edge of town, in the direction of the anti farm murder protesters. To me, this was not only reckless behaviour, but self-defeating in the sense that this person had no way to control whether he was going to strike one of his collaborators or one of his political opponents. Um, I think it is fair to say that it was very wild on the street for that time. And what happened at this juncture? The, the crowd in the front continued to dissipate. My understanding, although I couldn't see the very front, I later saw footage, was that the police were doing a very good job of keeping people at bay from one another right at the front. And not only the police, also some members maybe on either side. And so therefore, no major physical outbreak had taken place. And in the absence of a major outbreak, in the heat and uh, in the tension, I think uh, people more or less gave up hope uh, or maybe felt placated at the thought that something terrible is not going to happen and so they can retreat. I think those motives, I can't pass between those motives. Why would one individual do the one thing and not the other? But in short, most people drew back and eventually um, they had time to do that and there was some police that came walking through the streets, journalists that were crossing the streets, and then I remember it was quite striking of one of the first people to come from the anti-farm murder protester side was on a horse. Uh, it was a man on a horse and I think a woman on a horse and another woman on another horse. And he, I noticed, I wanted to take a photo because it struck me. He had a, a pamphlet from the Institute of Race Relations in his pocket and we discussed non-racialism. We then went on to discuss non-racialism with whoever we could find. It was my role to ask questions. Separate to that, I had a colleague, Shonen Boyson, and another colleague, Amy Claire Hogan, who were handing out pamphlets of the IRR to members of the EFF and to members of the ANC to encourage them to join our program of non-racialism. 
and reconciliation and a respect for property rights as a, as a route to a better path or a better life. Some of them engaged in interesting debates, which I thought was encouraging. It gave me a sense that the, almost as if the, the cork had popped and the excess energy had been released and not the cork talk. But then I realized that I, I was wrong in that impression when I and my colleagues saw members of the EFF or at least people who were wearing EFF regalia accost a young man who was wearing a t-shirt of an ANC youth league. And they said to him that it was wrong for him to wear such a t-shirt. They said the ANC is also a racist organization because the ANC has not, uh, the ANC has presided over a protection of property rights for white people, which was defined as racism. That young boy's t-shirt was then pulled from his body and set on fire in front of us. Um, uh, we tried to engage in further interviews to understand why people were were treating each other in this way. Um, the, the pendulum swing of tension and then release, tension and then release, uh, continued for some time. Uh, I left, my colleague Sikhe was doing a live stream asking EFF members why they were there. Um, and I was going to take notes and to file my report. Uh, my first report being that the worst was over, and my second report being about what saved the day. And, and in my opinion, what saved the day was, was the police force, uh, and respect for the police force. But I thought the police force did an excellent job that day, um, and I'm very grateful. I should say, I think my, my safety and the safety of most of the people who were there is, is, is largely thanks to the police force doing their job. You mentioned that on the night that you had arrived, you had a discussion with a colleague about an attack on the court um, on the 6th. Um, could you tell us about um, your discussion and the nature of that attack? The nature of that attack was what I would describe as vigilantes, trying to gain access to the court to take into hand the accused who subsequently been exonerated. Um, it seems that they wanted mob justice. This is completely unacceptable. Um, the discussion was about, I had initiated the discussion by saying that this is an unacceptable way to behave. Public property was destroyed. The, the credibility of the police was undermined. It was a humiliation of, of turning over a police vehicle and setting it on fire. The integrity of the court was undermined. There was just absolute disrespect shown to, to those core values that keep the society together. I wanted to know whether I should expect such behavior on the next day. That was one of my big fears. I was very afraid that people who were aggrieved about farm murders would take the law into their own hands. And in fact, it's a silly phrase that they would break the law, pretending what they are doing is to take the law into their own hands. But what they are really doing is breaking the law. So I asked, can I expect this to happen? And I was told, probably not. I was asked why. One of the reasons I was given was I was told that the, some of the people who had been gathered at the court that day on the 6th were plots and that others were um, miscreants. People in the community... So are you saying they were what? Plants. Plants. Yes. P-L-A-N-T-S. Correct. Okay. Could you describe what you mean by the term plants? What I mean by that is people who are there to serve an alternative agenda. People who are claiming to be there for one purpose. But really what they are doing is they are trying to incite the crowd from the inside to get the crowd to do something embarrassing, to undermine the purpose of the crowd that gathered there. I had no um, evidence to support or corroborate that allegation. 
that these were effectively spikes who had been sent in to drive the crowd. Okay. What I took away from that conversation was not that they were plants, but that the, the local farmers around Senecal and Paul Rue that I was speaking with considered these people as other, considered them as, uh, maybe it's too much to say the enemy, but as, as non-collaborators, as, as not members of their community, as not sharing their values or their purpose. They rejected those people, including those who were um, uh, uh, at some point detained for, for damage to public property. There was, there was really no sympathy expressed for them. It was the opposite of sympathy to say that that person was involved. So that was one of the reasons. That I, so I was told these people do not represent the, the general interest or how most people come from outside, they are not farmers, maybe they've even been paid by outsiders to make trouble, to embarrass the farmers. The other thing that I was told was that given all of the people that had gathered around Siena um, more structure had been put in place. The word I the phrase I often was command and control. Um, that responsible people had come into play to make sure that people behave themselves. And in that regard, um, <coughs> I did speak with an agricultural union called SAI. Um, they represented were quite keen on showing the presence in order to um, in order to reduce tension. In that regard, I was also told that there was some Although none of the people I was speaking to were members of Africorum, I was told that there was some gratitude that Africorum was coming because they would uh, put some discipline on their side and we had been told that they would be staying far away from the town so as not to add to the friction. We were very concerned about the friction. Of course, uh, I'm sure hardly anyone needs reminding that Shortly before we had gathered there, former president of the Republic, Kaklemo Motlante, had said, if there's any more friction, this in Senegal can lead to a civil war. To my mind, this was not a totally overblown statement. Because of that attack on the court, this brazen attack on a court by uh, one group, and on the other hand, because of the nature of the allegations that Brendan Warner's murder was connected to a stock theft, theft cartel implicating the police themselves, <coughs> this allegation that the police are covering up crime and murder, it seemed from every direction that the constitutional order we rely on was, was lacking in credibility. And if people don't believe in it, if people don't believe that they have to obey the law, then there's a more of a chance that people will break the law. And, uh, and, and that can lead to a very dangerous situation, especially where racial allegations are involved. Of course, the tension in my mind was not eased by uh, the head of the EFF's response to it. What was that response? Uh, he had said shortly before uh, coming down to Siena it was put to him on Newsroom Africa that the former president had said if there is more friction it can lead to civil war. And Malema responded, so be it. Um, he then said that, and I'm not quoting him directly, and I'm sure that can be resolved. He, but he said words to the effect that he was going in to exercise his rights, his civil rights, to be present in Siena. And I thought that is a good thing to say. And I can see there's a legal argument there that no one should be able to block members of the EFF from coming into Siena. Uh, it is every South African's right to freedom of movement. And I thought it is good that... Uh, Mr. Malema is emphasizing that 
the importance of that right. At the same time, I was concerned by the tension of false psychotic. Just because you have a right to freedom of movement, and just because you are exercising that right, doesn't mean you're not going to do something else as well. <coughs> so it seemed to me you had not really addressed the major question, which was, are you also going to add to the friction? And you might add to the friction, not by being there, which is your right, but by saying certain things, which maybe are or maybe are not within your rights. I don't know that I'm in a position to say that. But insofar as that was a concern, that concern was not allayed by the interview. In fact, there was some worry when he said, if there's a civil war, so be it. To me, it is very important to try and avert such a circumstance. Um, and again, that was part of our mission was to understand but also other members of the IRR were there to try and hand out pamphlets to say uh, that we as South Africans can be better together. You have referred to the, the group that attacked the court as a group of vigilantes and a group of outsiders, and you made mention that when you were present at court there were a group of people you described as uh, anti-farm murder protesters. Um, what were your observations of that group of people who are anti-farm murder protesters? The first thing that I saw, I arrived with at the same time as the team from Cot Blanche on the morning, and we saw a pastor stand up and uh, well, he identified himself as a pastor or something, and make some prayers. And um, there was a speech given by a man who uh, identified himself as a black South African who opposed farm murders. Um, and I was encouraged to see that the crowd was encouraged to see that, that the multiracial element there was seemed to be a strength rather than a weakness or, or anything uncomfortable. Um, I then saw all of the members get down on their knee and, uh, and, and sing the Lord's Prayer. Um, I felt it was my place to join, so I just bowed my head. And then after I conducted some interviews, I had to wait my turn. For example, the Carter Branch, Carter Branch team would get a chance to go first, because they have a, a broader reach than our audience. Um, in the interviews that I did, it was clear to me that people were very worried. It was clear to me that there were some concerns about the fact that the anti-farm murder protesters were all outside of town, whereas the EFF and the ANC were inside of town next to the court, not right next to the court, but close to the court. Some people expressed a concern that this was unfair. I, I'm not sure that it is unfair or it isn't unfair, but that was something that was discussed and it was important insofar as some people said maybe we should go into town to reclaim the town, which is a phrase that would resonate with both what had been said um, by Julius Malema before he had come to Senegal and also what was said by leadership of the EFF when they were in Senegal, which is that they were there to, in a sense, take the town. So I could see there was this competition to be the ones who were allowed to walk around in town. And in the course of that morning, not anyone could walk around in town. As I said, it was difficult for me, even as a journalist, it was impossible for me to walk in town. In your view, are there further ramifications for um, South Africa as a sort of uh, society that tries to value on racialism and tries to avert civil war from the events that you saw in Senegal and the, the killing of President Horner? Yes, the ramification can go in two directions. On the positive side, we can learn the lesson that we all depend on law and order and the rule of law. The former meaning that the police are respected and the criminal justice system brings about accountability, and the latter meaning that all individuals are equal before the law. And that in 
so far as we can tank, we can get through difficult times peacefully. And then in fact, we, we, we can go a long way together. I should say that in Senegal, a year later, we, we, we did uh, receive reports and had one of our colleagues go through to see that some members of the community were working conspicuously across racial lines to try to fix things in public infrastructure to, to, to work together. And I think sometimes it's important to show that you are working together. For the most part, it is very important just to work. But now and then, to let the camera see you, it can also be helpful to send a message to others. That is one direction that we can go. We can see some people in Senegal have taken that direction. There is another direction that things can go, which is that we can uh, we can find ourselves in a situation where we push harder again next time. There is no doubt in my mind that there will be more farm murders in the next month and that there will be more farm murders this winter. And there is very little doubt in my mind that in the course of, if not this year, then the next, but probably, I mean, even right now we can see at the virtual young for you that there have been parents fighting each other across racial lines. Every time an instance like this happens, those who say that this is normal, those who say that to be a South African is, a, is an afterthought, that primarily you are a white person, or a black person, or an Indian person, or a colored person, and that your loyalty and your allegiance, that your grievance and that your, your hopes must lie within that group, and that this is how it is for everyone, and that this is why we cannot get along, and that this is why it is normal for us to fight one another. Every time such an instance happens, that side finds it easier to say this is normal, to normalize <coughs> racial strife. <coughs> it is our mission to push against that. We believe that. It's not just a normative question, it's also a descriptive question. Most South Africans do not think this way. But it doesn't take most South Africans to have an insurrection. It doesn't actually take most South Africans to have a civil war. It just takes a few highly organized, highly vocal South Africans that are willing to do violence, to, to drive wedges through socially salient cleavages, and to abuse our history to serve their own nefarious immediate agendas. It only takes a few to, to bring this country to its knees. I'm sure everybody knows that from our experience in July last year. Um, and uh, from the xenophobic pogroms that we've had since 2008. So, it is my concern that after an incident like Senegal, people can draw the wrong lesson and they can think the problem with what happened on Senegal was that it ended peacefully. That if only someone had been killed on that day and there had been more of a fight, that this would have been better because it would have accelerated the path to, to a different political system. <coughs> My Lord, I have no further questions. Thank you very much. My Lord, I note it is uh, 10 past 11, and it may be uh, an appropriate junction to take the tea adjournment before cross examination. Yes, thank you very much. We will adjourn until half past 11, the cultural adjourn. <coughs>